The Tom Woods Show, episode 1981. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, don't even think about missing the libertarian event of the year the 2000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, live in Orlando, featuring many of your favorites from The Tom Woods Show. And Michael Malice says his special surprise guest, whose identity I myself don't even know, will bring the house down. Cost nothing to attend. Register at tomwoods2000.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Well, last week or the week before, I had an opportunity to talk to Keith Knight on his Don't Tread on Anyone podcast, which you can find over at the Libertarian Institute at libertarianinstitute.org. I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1981. And it's one of the most satisfying interviews I can recall doing over the past couple of years. He more or less gave me a lightning round in which he reviewed a series of great people in our tradition. So Thomas Sowell, Lysander Spooner, Adam Smith, a variety of people, and asked me to give a condensed overview of the significant ideas of this person or why this person really mattered in our tradition. And I just loved it. I just loved being able to do that. He throws a name at me, bang, I I bark out an answer. I think you'll enjoy it. I'm really, really pleased with it. So without further ado, here we go. Keith Knight interviewing the old man here, old Woods, on the Don't Tread on Anyone podcast. Here it is. My basic motivation for being a libertarian has never been economic but moral. While I was convinced that the free market was more efficient and would bring about a far more prosperous world than statism, my major concern was moral. The insight that coercion and aggression of one man over another was criminal and iniquitous and must be combated and abolished. Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute. Today I'm joined by Thomas E. Woods, Jr., a Ph.D. from Columbia, as well as Harvard Dr. Woods, where is the best place to find your collection of ebooks and podcasts? Well, I have considered having one site with all the ebooks on it, but apparently there's some marketing principle that says if you give people too many choices, they get overwhelmed and they don't choose anything. So you present the ebooks one at a time. <laughs> so uh, the one actually that I, I just did an episode of my own show about has to do with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is sort of the opposite of the kind of person we're going to be talking about today, just because I keep coming across people in the libertarian world who say she's the most libertarian member of Congress. And I think the state of libertarian education has probably been better. (laughs) So I have been really pushing my AOC ebook, which is quite memorably called AOC is Wrong. And so I I store that. It's available at aocisrong.com. And I know that the point of our interview is not to talk about my domain names, but I do want to say that Fortune was smiling on me when I decided to buy aocisrong.com because I bought that before people had started calling her AOC. She wasn't quite well known enough and didn't have the notoriety yet for there to be this three initial nickname. I chose it because her real name is too long for a domain name. I thought, so I just made it AOC, and then everyone started calling her AOC. This is unbelievable that I own, I own AOCiswrong.com. So I would send people there, get that. Links to that will be in the description below. Tom, I want to talk about some of our heroes in the freedom movement. Please give me what you think is either this person's greatest contribution or one thing that you learned from them that uh, really stands out. What is the greatest contribution or most important thing you learned from Hans Hermann Hoppe? All right. Well, first of all, let me ask, just so I can pace myself correctly, is this a lightning round with 50 names or is it going to be like four names? 12 names. 12 names. All right. So what would your ideal response time for each of these be? Three minutes. Oh, three minutes for each. All right. I'll keep an eye on the clock. Okay. All right. Well, Hans has become known in terms of his books for his book on democracy. And that is a book that really did kind of bring me fully over into the ANCAP world. But long before that book, I had read his books, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property and A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. And for me, it's not just one major contribution, it's a bunch of insights. So I think his critique of the public goods argument is very, very effective, that there are some goods that 
they're uh, non-rivalrous and non-excludable, and they have to be provided for by government or they'll be underprovided on the market. And he just shows the string of inconsistencies in that. So his book, A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, has a great chapter on that. But there's a chapter in his book, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property, that to this day continues to blow my mind. And I am sorry because of my advanced age, I don't remember the name of the chapter, but you'll know it when you see it. Because even though a book called The Economics and Ethics of Private Property sounds dull and boring, it is one of the most intellectually exciting books you will ever read. And he has a chapter in there in which he begins from primitive society using barter. And step by step, he gets you to a modern economy with a fiat money system. And he shows how you go from barter to commodity money to commodity money with paper substitutes and then to just the paper with no commodity backing. And then he shows where banking comes from. And from all this, he talks about politics. He has given you an analysis, a way to look at the world and understand what's going on. Like, why would there be a move toward a one world currency or regional currencies? Why would that be? Well, that would be not for the sake of convenience or all that. We had convenience when we had a gold standard. That was convenient. This is convenience for the ruling class because it means that it's harder for one national currency to outcompete another when there aren't any national currencies. There's one being inflated at a consistent rate throughout the whole zone. So you, you just look at the world totally differently just from that one chapter. But then finally, thinking of democracies as being like publicly owned governments helps to account for a lot of what goes on. Since the caretakers who watch over the government every two, four, or six years have no personal stake in it, it's not their private property, they don't care what condition it's in when they leave because they're not leaving it to their son. What do they care if they rack up debts or they have endless wars or they do all kinds of preposterous things? The kinds of incentives they operate under are exactly the kind of incentives you have when you're driving a rental car. Now, it doesn't mean that you always go out and crash a rental car, but when was the last time you washed a rental car? When was the last time you got an oil change for a rental car? So you don't think of the long-term capital value of it. Same thing with a country. So these, to me, are very, very important insights. Most important thing you learned from Thomas Sowell. Okay. First of all, I think one of the most valuable Sowell books is not, you know, there, there are some soul books that everybody sort of knows the titles of. But one of the forgotten soul books is his little book from the mid-1980s called Civil Rights, Rhetoric, or Reality. And if you go to Amazon, you will actually see that I have a review of that book from many years ago that I'm very happy with and proud of. That book, what I love about it is that every single page is smashing some myth. And so, for example, people think, well, discrimination causes poverty or the differences in income or educational outcomes or whatever between all kinds of groups, not just racial ones, are explainable by discrimination. And he says that is just such an easy, convenient, comic book style argument, but it just doesn't hold. When you hold all different groups constant and you look at people in the same geographical area, you know, you look at people in the same age range with the same level of work experience and on and on, then all these variations actually disappear, which is very interesting. Or if you, some people will say, oh, there must be discrimination because white PhDs earn more than black PhDs. He says, well, let's disaggregate the data and see what do they have the PhDs in? Because it turns out that Asian PhDs out earn white PhDs because they have PhDs generally in things like engineering, whereas at least half of black PhDs are in education. And we all know that education is not a highly remunerative field. So in other words, he would look at the conventional wisdom, but under the microscope of data. He would look at these big aggregates and he would say, the answer to whether this is true or not comes from breaking it down and disaggregating it. So things like that. But what I also learned, frankly, was a moral lesson. And that is about his courage in doing and saying the things he did because it meant academic isolation. It meant being called names. But honestly, what is impressive about him is that none of that seemed to matter. Honestly, you would see him on television and he just would be like a hot knife through butter and he didn't care what you said. 
Could you briefly explain the difference between the constrained and unconstrained worldview? Yes, this is um, this is in his book, A Conflict of Visions. And the unconstrained vision way of looking at the world is, because I guess what he was trying to explain, although I don't think he quite put it this way, is why is it that people who think the economy can be planned and who think you know, the minimum wage should be X dollars an hour and who think we should be locked in our homes because of COVID, like all these sorts of disparate different things all seem to reside in the same mind. And people who disagree, it's very rare for people to have one of those opinions and not every single one of the others. Now, why should that be? And what he, what he decided was there are two primary visions that people might have of the world. The unconstrained vision is one in which, and I don't mean to caricature it, but if we can think it, we can create it. If we can dream it, it can be made to happen. That there's no sense of the tragic fallen aspect of human nature, that we can remake ourselves if we need to, to create the world that we want. We can use our, our brains to plan and create an economy of abundance and so on and on. Whereas the constrained vision is more pessimistic about what can be accomplished through reason and through planning and through human effort. That in fact, it's actually not possible to plan an economy for a variety of reasons. And our temptation is to think that because I plan my life, I can plan an economy. But these things, these are entirely different. So he's saying that the constrained vision is one that understands that human nature is what it is and isn't going to be changed. And so we shouldn't try totalitarian programs to change it in order to bring about our amazing vision of what the world could be. Because what instead we'll wind up doing is creating some horrific totalitarian nightmare and not exactly have a wonderful society to show for it. We'll break a lot of eggs, but we'll never get the omelet. How about Lysander Spooner? All right, Lysander Spooner, a number of things from Spooner. I mean, the primary one most people get has to do with the Constitution. I found his work on the unconstitutionality of slavery to be, be very interesting because whether or not I'm convinced by it, I thought his argumentation was interesting. His point was, and this was a line of argument that was picked up by Frederick Douglass, by the way. It was a minority line of argument among abolitionists. Most of them, like William Lloyd Garrison, said the Constitution is a pro-slavery document and that's why it's a covenant with hell and we should burn it in public. But Spooner wasn't so sure. He said, well, let's look at the different parts of the Constitution that are alleged to involve slavery. He says, now, in no case is the word slavery used. And in each case, I can come up with a benign interpretation of what it means. So why should we be compelled to accept a pro-slavery, anti-freedom interpretation unless the text absolutely demands it? I don't care about the intentions of the people who wrote it. I can't be bound by the intentions of people behind some closed doors. The only thing that is relevant to us are the words themselves. And the words do not compel us to a pro-slavery conclusion. And therefore, because slavery is such an offense against natural law, we should never assume slavery. We should always assume not slavery. And since we can come up with an anti-slavery interpretation of these words, then we should do so. So, I mean, that's at least an interesting way to approach the question. But the other main thing has to do with the Constitution and whether constitutions truly bind us. And now, interestingly, Spooner does not think it's anti-libertarian to vote. He actually addresses the argument that if you vote, then you're giving your consent to the system. That's not his view. It's, if you vote, you're trying to use a defense mechanism that you've been given to try to make your life better. In the same way that if you were in prison and you got to vote on whether you ate slop or prime rib, and you voted for prime rib, it's not because you consent to the prison system, it's that you wanna make your life materially better. And if you abstain from voting, maybe you're gonna wind up eating slop, how's that an improvement? So, but his key thing was, I never consented to this document. And there's no other aspect of life. Like when you, when you buy a house, you gotta sign, like you have a special day, the closing day, where you go in and you just spend an hour signing documents. He says, now that's just to buy a house. This is an arrangement where we can conscript you, we can grab your money, we can tell you what to do, we can lock you in a cage if you make us unhappy, and I don't sign anything? Sorry, I don't buy that. Ludwig von Mises. All right, now Mises, I think his primary contributions really are 
economic. Whereas with Rothbard, it's economics and a number of other fields. Now, Mises certainly contributed to other fields, but his real contributions were economics. Well, again, in his case, certainly moral courage, because he comes from Austria in 1940 with a sort of a working knowledge of English, but it's, it's definitely not his first language. He doesn't typically write in English, but he did write human action in, in English with the help of uh, Henry Hazlitt smoothing out his German style of English, which you can still see bits and pieces of. He has some kind of complicated sentences. And of course, in German, the word order doesn't matter quite as much. So you're guided by the, you know, the different forms of the verbs and the nouns and stuff to figure out what's really going on in the sentence. But anyway, I, I happen to like Mises' prose. So the fact that he stood up against the spirit of his age and against the totalitarians, the Nazis who were taking over in, in Central and Eastern Europe at that time, and then came to the U.S. and stood up to the academics in the U.S., who were all falling in love with Marxism and partial Marxism, and he just wouldn't have any of it. And today, when we look back on New York University, nobody knows who was teaching in the economics department at NYU in 1961. Name me somebody. But we know the name Ludwig von Mises because his work is still discussed and, and still considered important. With Mises, of course, there are many things that you would say that you walked away with from it. But certainly his theory of the business cycle is very relevant to us today, that when you interfere with market interest rates, you set in motion a series of events that can't be unwound until the economy has come undone and needs to be redone in a sustainable fashion in the way it would have been done without artificially low interest rates. So the idea that we can fiddle with prices like the price of milk well, most people recognize that that's going to lead to problems, that the price of milk is not arbitrary. But when it's interest rates, everybody thinks this is the key to permanent prosperity. But, but can it be really manipulating a rate lower than it was set by the decisions of millions of people? I mean, really, like, so then we shouldn't have any more foreign aid. Just tell Bangladesh, lower your interest rates if there are no real consequences of that. I mean, just instinctively, we know this is preposterous. And Mises walks us through step by step exactly why it is so. So that's one of many, many economic contributions from Mises. Michael Humer. Okay, well, I love Michael Humer, and I highly recommend people read his book, The Problem of Political Authority. And I would say that book rivals the economics and ethics of private property in sounding like a boring book. But it is anything but. It is a rollicking demolition of argument after argument for the state, for democracy as being the, the most moral system. And what humor is good at is instead of abstract theorizing, most of the time his arguments are made through really, really vivid analogies. And so a very, very simple analogy drawn from the book involves you and your friends going out after class and having a drink. And your friends all vote that you're going to pay for the drinks. Does that mean you're obligated to pay for the drinks? Well, of course not. I don't value any of your stupid opinions at all. Why would you get to vote on who has to pay and it happens to be me? So he says, well, how is this different? Is there some magic dust that's sprinkled on people when there's a whole lot of them and, you know, and one of them happens to be like a political leader and people have voted for him? So once they vote for him, there's a magic dust that means that if he issues a command you're obligated to comply. What is the source of political obligation, he wants to know. And he says, he basically what he's saying is, every time we take the arguments for political obligation, well, we all consented to this, or, well, most of us consented to this, and it's impractical for us all to consent, so you just gotta do what you're told. He says, there's no way we would accept this in any other area of our lives, not in the bar, not anywhere else. So why suddenly do we have to accept it here and Basically, the answer usually is a lot of hemming and hawing. And now, sorry, as a rigorous philosopher, I don't accept hemming and hawing as an argument. So highly, highly recommended book. John Hasness. Ah, uh, John Hasness. I got to meet him once years and years ago. 1992, I met him at an event put on by the Institute for Humane Studies. And he's, I think he's still a law professor at Georgetown. And he's written a lot of things. and. But the article that has stuck out all these years later and is still compelling 
is the myth of the rule of law. And very early on in the Tom Woods show, I did an episode of my podcast with him on this. Who knows what number it is? I'm, you know, maybe some followers of mine are like the Star Trek convention people, like they've memorized all the episode numbers. But if you look up Hasness at tomspodcast.com, do a search and page, you'll find it. And his argument was with the myth of the rule of law that people are, are just naive about the state, even so-called small government conservatives, or maybe especially those people, because they think there's an objective way to interpret those words on a page. And if we just get judges who will do that, then we'll be set. And so he gave us a thought experiment in the classroom. He said, all right, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law, and you know, and he goes on and on respecting the freedom of speech and all that. And then he listed a bunch of, of things that the government might do. And he says, can the government, according to this, can the government do this? Can it do this? Can it do this? Can it do this? And of course, we all said, no, 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 no. The First Amendment prohibits all that. And then he went and reviewed it with us. He said, okay, well, uh, for number one, those of you who said no treated Congress as if it said the president. So you got that wrong. Then he, and then he just listed, <laughs> he said, basically all of you inserted your own wishful thinking into these words instead of actually looking at the words on the page. And so he pursues this argument further and actually has you convinced by the end that there is no way to come up with words that some judge couldn't figure out some way to interpret in a way that gets him the outcome he wants. And it's a, it's a terrifying conclusion, really, because it, it forces you into, let's say, a political posture you weren't expecting to adopt when you started reading his article. Michael Malice. Oh, geez. I, geez, I've learned a lot from Michael Malice on a personal level. Sometimes what not to do, I'll grant you. But... I've definitely learned a lot from him in just in life lessons because he's helped me through a lot of some difficult times in my life. But also what I like about him is that he finds, he doesn't say that evil isn't evil, but he finds silver linings that I don't see sometimes. So sometimes I'll say, look at this terrible thing the regime is doing or, or look at this awful speech this Politico just gave. But then he'll say, no, I don't know, listen to that speech again. Does that sound like the speech of somebody who feels really in control of things? Who feels like society is going just the way they want? Oh, yeah. I hadn't quite looked at it that way. But he often does look at it that way. And he's currently at work on a book to be called The White Pill. And he's going back and looking at, among other things, the, the, uh, the terrors, the horrors of communism. And those were overcome. Those actually were overcome in our lifetimes. We saw people rising up against them. It's very, very easy, especially in, in our present times, to, to grow discouraged. But it's important to remember, even now, even with the censorship and the BS we have to put up with, even now, we're vastly better off than we were with three television channels. If there were three television channels, no one would know about the Tom Woods show. There couldn't be a Tom Woods show. There couldn't be this conversation. So it is important... You know, much as we have to emphasize the suffering that we're enduring and the injustices of it all, at the same time, for the sake of perspective, it is important to realize the advances that we've made because we have made them and those can save us from debilitating discouragement. Scott Horton. Ah, Scott Horton. First of all, he's taught me what one person's brain is capable of holding, right? Just when you think, no, there's gotta be a finite amount once you learn enough things, other things must get pushed out or something. No, apparently not, <laughs> because Scott just knows it and knows it and knows it. But this is a guy who, for years and years, I mean, I think now Scott is really getting recognition that he deserves. Noam Chomsky recently twice praised Scott's book, Fool's Errand, the book on, on Afghanistan. And that's great. I mean, he got a copy, Scott sent it to him, and he actually read it. And he holds it in very high regard. And that's great. And now Scott goes to conferences and he walks out there and he gets huge cheers from everybody. But he labored for years in relative obscurity. You know, not that many people knew who he was. But he just did his interviews. He did his shows. He learned and learned and learned and became the unbelievable expert he is today. And not because he majored in Middle Eastern studies in college. I don't know if 
I don't know if Scott went to college, to be honest with you. I just know that he reads everything he can. He listens to a wide variety of voices and he has an amazing ability to synthesize all this. But in terms of what I've learned academically, it is primarily the counterproductive nature of almost everything the US government does in foreign policy, particularly the war on terror. And then on a smaller scale, I know I can ask him, well, what, did the surge work? If not, what was the problem with the surge? And I can get the answer from him anytime I want to right away. Adam Smith. Adam Smith did teach me a bit about the division of labor, although he was teaching the division of labor in terms of in one firm. You know, somebody does this part, somebody does that part, and if everybody just does one little part, we get more done in the same amount of time. But the real interesting thing about the division of labor is the division of labor across the whole society. But that was, that's still something. But mainly what, what Smith taught me was that society or commerce are self-regulating in the sense that we don't need to say we have a major pencil shortage. So we're going to need more firms producing pencils. We don't need to send that message to anybody because they'll get the message when they see that the price of pencils just tripled. And so somebody will think, whoa, now that price is high enough that I should consider going into pencil creation. So what will happen then is that there'll be a greater supply of pencils now, and that'll put downward pressure on the price of pencils until those abnormal profits are, are dissipated, and then we move on. Or if, if suddenly people decide they want to use ballpoint pens from now on, they don't like pencils. So now you can barely sell pencils at all. You got to sell them at a very low price and that leads to losses in pencil firms. So again, we don't need to send out a memo. We have too many pencil firms now. They figure that out on their own better than and sooner than and more efficiently than any politician could. And so this then can lead us to further insights of our own. Like when there is a shortage caused by a natural disaster, a shortage of lumber. Well, what's that going to mean? It's going to mean that if lumber's price is allowed to rise sufficiently high, then people will people will build rafts from across the, you know, from another island and 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 row over there to bring them lumber if they have to at that price. Or somebody will say, I'm willing to give up my weekend where I'd look forward to having a beer and watching the game. I'm gonna give up my weekend to drive two states away to bring lumber because the price is so high. But if you just force the price down, you're interfering in this natural process that Smith identified. And so instead, all that's going to mean is that that lumber will be snatched up immediately, not used for its most value productive use. While a lot of people are going without lumber, that's not the right solution. So these, these, these subsidiary insights come from Smith's insight. Ralph Rako. I miss Ralph Rako so much. He was a historian at uh, Buffalo State College, a uh, senior fellow of the Mises Institute. And he wrote a couple of books before he died one of them was Great Wars and Great Leaders, and the other one, I, I'm sorry, is escaping me, but it was really a compilation of his, of his lengthy articles on a variety of topics, from Woodrow Wilson to German liberalism and a lot of topics that he was knowledgeable about. But I really learned an awful lot about what I know about World War I and U.S. intervention directly from hearing Rako discuss the absurdity of it. So that'd be the first thing. I also learned about the scholarship and debate around the Industrial Revolution and whether or not that on net benefited the average person. So for a while, there was a debate that was called the standard of living debate, and it was divided into two camps. One was called the optimist and one the pessimist, and you can sort of figure out which was which. But as time went on by the 1970s, the optimists had more or less won the debate because even a Marxist like E.P. Thompson was forced to admit that, well, nobody says everything got worse. But, but they were saying that before. <laughs> you know, it wasn't nobody. They were saying everything got worse. So it was people like T.S. Ashton and R.H. Uh, Maxwell and, and others, and then later lesser-known scholars like Suda Shinoy of, I can't remember if she, she was from New Zealand or Australia, who wrote a lot about it. And then, of course, Deirdre McCloskey has written about this too, that we see that, in fact, whether we look at living space per capita, clothing, caloric intake, life expectancy, income, uh, whatever, we see that actually the standard of living was improved and would have been improved further in Britain if it hadn't coincided with a lot of warfare that Britain was involved in in the wars of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. 
historian Paul Johnson. All right, now Paul Johnson is not a quote unquote professional historian. So other historians hate him. Uh, the same way they hated David McCullough, who wrote a biography of John Adams and a number of other books, 1776. And that's mostly just professional jealousy because most professional historians write excruciatingly boring books that even their peers only pretend to read. So the fact that McCullough gets rich as a historian or Johnson gets rich, they can't stand it. But also Johnson was extremely prolific. I mean, he wrote a history of the American people that I, I'm only so-so on. I really like his, I, I like his book, Intellectuals. I like his book, Modern Times, which is a, like a, a history of the 20th century. But past that, he was also, it turns out, a tremendous art aficionado. So he wrote a huge book called A History of Art, spanning art all around the world. Turns out that was just one of his hobbies. So he decided to write a majestic book about that. He wrote a history of Christianity, which I think he wrote in his more left-wing years, so I don't necessarily recommend it. He wrote a history of the Jews, extremely prolific. And I was told as a college freshman by another freshman that I should read Johnson's book, Modern Times. And I, see, when you're a Harvard freshman, people tell you to read 800-page books or whatever it was, and they expect you to actually do it. And I did it. And I loved every minute of it because he writes in a crisp, an engaging style where there are curious and interesting anecdotes on every page and quotations you've never heard before or interesting tangents he'll go on about some, some invention and why it mattered. And there was nobody like him, really. And in modern times taught me that the people I had been taught were great presidents were actually bad and the supposedly bad presidents were oftentimes not so bad. So that was a key insight. But beyond that, I learned a lot about the history of Africa in the 20th century and the socialist experiments that occurred in Africa when Western educated African leaders returned to Africa and imposed on their poor people the stupid ideas they got in the West, but that there were some exceptions where they, they didn't impose uh, outright socialism and they wound up doing a lot better. So I learned really about the dangers of collectivism as illustrated by the atrocities of the 20th century and the failed socialist experiments of the 20th century. Folks, was I right when I said this was a pretty good interview? I'm interrupting it for just a minute because you and I need to have a one-on-one -on -one podcast host to listener talk. And that has to do with reminding you to do something you know you need to do, but haven't gotten around to. You got to get around to it. And that has to do with my sponsor, Policy Genius. To provide for their families properly, most people need 10 times the life insurance coverage that they get through their employers. And Policy Genius makes it easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all in one place. Why compare? Well, it's obvious. You compare, you get the best price. And in fact, you could save $1,300 or more per year on life insurance by using Policy Genius to compare policies. Policy Genius has earned thousands of five star reviews across Trustpilot and Google, and eligible applicants can get covered in as little as a week thanks to an award winning policy option that swaps the standard medical exam requirement for a simple phone call. Getting started is easy. First, head to policygenius.com, and almost instantly you'll be working out how much life insurance coverage you need and comparing personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and scheduling for free. Policy Genius does not add on extra fees. So head to policygenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. How about Murray Rothbard? Oh, come on. Uh, all right, how many more do I have after Murray Rothbard so I can pace this? No, we, we got about five more. Oh, geez. I okay. think I lied about the 12. I apologize. All right, well, <sighs> I learned so much from Rothbard. I really don't know where to start. I... I his work on the Great Depression convinced me that it was the Fed's intervention in the 20s that led to the, the crack up in, in uh, 1929. I learned that Herbert Hoover was an interventionist, which is what the historians now admit, but it took them long enough to catch up to Rothbard. But I also learned the basic contours of Austrian economics by studying the concepts in man, economy, and state. That was of great importance to me. And I, I understood better where Mises was coming from by reading Rothbard's scholarly articles on epistemology and economics. But I learned about the history of economic thought by reading his two volumes on it. I learned about the period of pseudo-anarchy in the history of early colonial Pennsylvania that I hadn't known about, but that is 
worth knowing that when the British representatives showed up, they got to the whatever the hall was that the politicos were supposed to meet in, and it was all dusty with papers everywhere, <laughs> no sign of anyone having been there in the longest time. You know, there's just little things like that I, I uh, enjoyed learning from, from him. But I also learned about people who, before the Cold War got into really high gear in the 1950s, were warning that that was a bad idea, that communism was terrible, but converting your country into a, uh, a gigantic warfare state might be a mistake, and it might be a mistake you never, ever get to take back. And we're living through that right now. We have a military that just keeps going around looking for, for enemies. That it, It's a program in search of justification. Well, I think that maybe we're, we should have learned a lesson from all that. But, I, you know, I, I learned about some of the ideological movements of the 1960s, which Rothbard latched onto, searching for anti-war people, but also the implications of the non-aggression principle are spelled out in great detail, not always in ways I agree with, but always in ways that make me think. In his book, The Ethics of Liberty, I learned about money and banking from Rothbard, you know, where money comes from and what the purpose it's supposed to serve and what's an example of a good money and transitioning back to a good money and all, all sorts of things like that. I remember asking him in person one time, is there a history of money written from a, go a pro-gold standard perspective? And he said, well, you might look at the minority report of the U.S. Gold Commission because it has a couple of lengthy chapters on the history. And sure enough, it's actually a, it's a book. The Cato Institute published it in, in the early 80s called The Case for Gold. So it's actually written in the form of a book. And sure enough, the historical material in there is tremendously good. I found out only after Rothbard's death that he wrote those chapters but he didn't tell me that. He could easily have said, I wrote the chapters on economic history in that report, but he didn't say a word about that. He just let, let me read it without realizing it was his thing. So he also taught me humility, I guess. Frederick Bastiat. Bastiat lived up until the mid 19th century and was an economic journalist, but was also an excellent economist in his own right and is not given proper credit for that. But he's one of, he is the first person who taught me the principle of the unseen. That in economics, it's not sufficient to look at something solely with your physical eyes. You also need to look at it with your mind's eye. Because for example, if the government builds some big project and then says, hey everybody, look at this big project and you should congratulate us for this big project, that's what you see with your physical eyes. But surely the labor and the resources and the time to create this thing would have gone into something else, the satisfaction of other needs. But I can't see those because they weren't allowed to come into existence. So we have to evaluate it in terms of the opportunities foregone. So for example, in the 19th century, suppose somebody wanted to develop the iPod. Well, obviously none of the relevant technology exists. So they would have had to engage in absolutely impoverishing levels of expenditure to do the research and develop the technology at that time to create an iPod. It would not even remotely be worth it. But it's supposed they did. And they said, hey, everybody, look at this iPod. You wouldn't have had that if you'd waited for your stupid free market to develop it. But the thing is, if we'd waited for the stupid free market to develop it, it wouldn't have had to come at such a huge expense to our standard of living. The market will develop it when we're ready when we're willing to save the resources necessary for the R&D and for everything else, when we're willing to engage in the voluntary saving that lowers interest rates and tells entrepreneurs now's the time to, to borrow and, and to invest in, in these long-term projects, that's when we'll get it. So sometimes people say, look, the government invented this technology. We would never have had that. In the well, probably we would have because we're not stupid. We would have developed these things. There is a controversy about so-called crossover technology. When the government creates something, you think, well, would we have had Tang if it weren't for astronauts? Well, there's a lot of research on this, but some research says maybe 95% of this stuff would have been developed privately anyway, and the other 5%, who even knows if we need it or not? So Bastiat is constantly reminding us that we have to evaluate these sorts of things in terms of the opportunity cost and the importance of opportunity cost in economics. Pat Buchanan. All right, Pat Buchanan, first of all, I learned the, uh, the value of somebody who, even though he gets criticized, you know, oh, you wrote this column in 1977, 
He doesn't just get on his knees and beg forgiveness. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care that he wrote an unfashionable column in 1977 because he's too busy writing his columns in 2021. And he's too busy churning out best-selling books in those years. So one of the things I learned from him, is certainly his book, A Republic, Not an Empire, I thought was very valuable as a history book. I think he's very, very knowledgeable as a historian. So I would say that I, I learned some stuff about interventionism and, and, and from Pat. Also, when in 1991, the Persian Gulf War occurred, Pat was against that. And I, at the time, I didn't understand why, because I thought, well, we're right-wingers, we're Republicans, so we support the military. And right now, the military is involved in this war. I couldn't understand why he was against it, but he was teaching me something at that point. It's not war per se, or the military per se that we support. In his case, it was we had to stop the threat of communism. It's not because just whatever the Pentagon tells me, I just endorse it. And so that paved the way for me to think in healthier ways about war and the military. But the key thing he taught me had nothing to do with history or politics. I had uh, dinner with him one time back in um, around 2005, I guess. And my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, had just come out. And uh, initially, right-wingers really liked it, and it, it sold really well. But then the neocons discovered it. They didn't like it at all, because it was not a neocon telling of American history. And Pat told me, these people basically just, they just endorsed the New York Times version of American history. You know, that's just the way they are. So they're not going to like your book. But I told him, they are attacking me viciously and unfairly. And, you know, what am I going to do? And his answer was, where there is no solution, there is no problem. There's nothing you can do about that. They're going to write what they're going to write. So you don't really have a problem because there is no solution to it. If you have a problem, you sit there and think about how am I going to fix it? You can't fix it. So what was his advice? Just keep working your tail off. You know, just basically do what Pat does. Just keep churning out best-selling books. Get your revenge that way. And that's what I did. I wrote articles, I made videos, I wrote books, and people just kept on discovering me. They discovered me through video platforms or through events or through word of mouth or through my books and articles. And now I've gotten to a point where I can actually make a living as a podcaster. I mean, this is like, if that's not a unicorn, I don't know what is. Lou Rockwell. All right, Lou's, Lou's analysis of the world really, really helped shape my own. Because a lot of times there would be something going on in the world and I didn't know quite what to think about it. And I would always want to get Lou's take on it. And I remember there was some, now you'll have to forgive me the details are murky. This could have been 20 years ago. But there was some episode where, I don't know if it was a US plane passing through Chinese airspace or some kind of thing like that. And the Chinese were vigorously objecting to it. And American patriots were all upset. And Lou had the gall to write an article called China Was Right. And from that moment on, I realized this guy just doesn't care. <laughs> he just is fearless. Or sometimes the right wing would say things like, we need to rein in the powers of the presidency. Well, there's no chance of that happening. There's absolutely no chance. If that was going to happen, it would have happened by now. So Lou instead would write an article called Down with the Presidency. Like, let's hope Bill Clinton is the last president of the United States. Well, he didn't get that particular wish. But his willingness to think the unthinkable and say the unsayable and take our analysis all the way, even if it took him to radical conclusions, has been a really important guide for me. Henry Hazlitt. All right, Hazlitt is going to take that idea of Bastiat, of the seen and the unseen, and really develop it into a whole approach to economics. Because Hazlitt, who... I know for a fact did not attend college, wrote economics in one lesson. It's, it has sold a couple million copies. <laughs> Any book on economics that sells a couple million copies and isn't a textbook that the kids are forced to buy must be impressive. And really, he is riffing on what Bastiat was saying. So if, if Hazlitt's going to talk about rent control, he's not going to leave it at Yep, rent control means people have lower rents. So look at these people. They have lower rents. I see that with my physical eyes. Well, again, anybody on any IQ level can see that with their physical eyes. What are the things that we're not seeing? So his point was, don't focus exclusively on what the immediate 
consequences of a policy are on the intended recipients. Focus on the long-term effects on everybody. So it's true that some people living in those apartments now get cheaper frozen rents. That's true. But do you really think that's it? That all we have to do, it's like passing a law against gravity. You really think that's going to work? What is this going to mean? Well, think of it this way. I like Walter Block's view of this. Now, he's not actually advocating this. He's just using it as a thought experiment. But he says, just to show how wrongheaded rent control is, consider this. It would actually be better if what you were seeking was an increased supply of of low-income housing. It would be better for you to impose price controls on literally every single thing in the economy except low-income housing. Because in that po- at that point, all the investment dollars would flood into low-income housing, and the supply would explode, and that would push the rents down, and that would get you exactly what you want. So when you realize that, then you realize, okay, well, then any measure that's not that is, is going to have some problem that we're not going to want. And so the rent control, of course, is going gonna, is gonna to send people far away from low-income housing. Why would they do that? They, I mean, you, first of all, low-income housing is not a lot of fun, okay? It's not a lot of fun trying to collect money in low-income housing buildings, okay? It's not something people are particularly excited about to begin with. And then they get the idea that the rents they charge could be arbitrarily changed. Forget it. They're not going to bother doing it. Or they'll do it, but they're not going to fix your leaky pipe, or they'll wait six months to fix it because with the rent this low, they can get, they have a million people waiting outside to get that room from you who won't complain about the leaky faucet and the leaky pipe. So they'll just go there. Whereas if you have low rents because there's an abundant supply, the landlord doesn't have a billion people waiting outside the door, (laughs) beating down his door. So he can be abusive and neglectful. So there are a million negative consequences that come from this. There would be fewer housing units available, but the problem would be very few people can see with their mind's eye. So very few people will say, the reason I'm having trouble finding housing is that rent control is making it unprofitable to build these houses. Instead, they'll look for help from the government, which is exactly the source of the problem. They'll blame the rich fat cats for X, Y, and Z. It gets people thinking in a completely poisoned way. Dave Smith. All right, Dave Smith is somebody I have thoroughly enjoyed watching grow into the superstar he is. And I would say from time to time, so I listen to Dave's podcast somewhat regularly, and I find that his analogies and explanations are really, really good, and they can help anybody understand. And sometimes he'll be somebody like Lou Rockwell, where I say, huh, wonder what Dave's take on this is going to be. And almost always I say, yeah, all he did was take libertarian theory and apply this thing to it. And he's fearless when it comes to debating people. He'll debate you. He'll have a good back and forth. But also, I frankly think it's admirable that he'll talk to Ben Burgess, who's a socialist, and um, tell him, I think that your book has certain merits. There are very few people who will reciprocate. There are not very many left-wingers who will have me on and say, hey, that's a super book you wrote. So I think that's, that's a great example for us. But the power of communication, effective communication, is illustrated very, very strongly through Dave. And I think that's why he's built up such a big audience. Finally, Ron Paul. Well, with Ron Paul, it's the value of, uh, of sticking to your guns and being consistent because it makes you credible because you hold this opinion in good times and bad. You know, on Twitter, sometimes I'll see people who don't know anything about me or anything about my friends say, well, what were you saying when Trump was bombing Syria? I was saying the same thing, of course. Why would I say anything different? I'm not like you. I mean, the sort of people who would ask me that are the sort of people who, yeah, in under Trump, they're really upset, and under Biden, they're making excuses. So they assume I'm the same way. It's projection. They assume I'm the same way. But unlike them, I have principles. Well, Ron Paul has principles like times a million. And he doesn't care if he gets invited to the fancy events or whatever. There was a time in in Bill Clinton's term where he was invited. They had a big thing at the Clinton White House. And they had this big receiving line where all the congressmen could get their pictures taken with Bill Clinton. And he just wandered, he and his wife just wandered around because they had absolutely no interest in that. 
That is not why he's here. I'm not here for celebrity. I'm not here to rub elbows. I'm not here to say, look at the cool people I hang around with. It's, I have really urgently important ideas I want to convey to the public. And he just stuck to that and stuck to that, which is why you can listen to him in 1983 and he sounds like him in 2021. So all that's valuable. But also I did read some of his early books. So I actually did read The Case for Gold, the whole thing, the history and the economics and all, and the, and the case that he made. I read his speeches and boy, I, that filled in a lot of gaps for me in terms of foreign policy and the neocons and, and all that. He's really got their number. And I, I definitely benefited from reading him. We got about five minutes left. Thank you so much for being generous with uh, your time. How can an understanding of Austrian economics help historians understand what happened and why? Well, I actually wrote, maybe you're even referring to an article of mine. I wrote an article for the journal of, uh, the quarterly journal of Austrian economics called What Austrian Economics Can Teach Historians. So you can Google that, or let's say use your favorite search engine these days, and you'll find uh, what Austrian economics can teach historians. So the, I would say that the, the quick version would be, I can give a specific example of the kind of thing we can learn, that if we're looking at an economic downturn, well, we're going to be inclined to look for, was there monetary inflation that preceded it? Because we have a theoretical understanding of where these downturns come from. So we're going to know where to look. We're going to know what to look for. If you don't have any theoretical underpinning, how would you know what to look for? Are you just going to just repeat some events that occurred? Okay, but how do you know that any of those events had anything to do with what happened? There's nothing, strictly speaking, in the historical data that's going to help you resolve that unless you have some understanding of how things work. So, And most historians don't have that. So the Austrian school will, will help you with that. So I gave that as an example, like a, a specific thing. Because you are in the Austrian school, you know this sort of thing. But beyond that, the Austrians... Well, let me, let me say this. I can also understand why a minimum wage policy had a certain effect, but the, the analysis of the minimum wage is not unique to the Austrian school. That would just be because I have economic knowledge, I can know that such and such thing will succeed or fail, or I can evaluate the claims being made by the politicians at the time. Like, for example, there are numerous times in American history where politicians have claimed that money is too scarce we need more money created. We don't have enough money. Well, I know right away they're just confused because any amount of money can facilitate any number of transactions as long as the prices are free to fluctuate. So I can immediately know that's just demagogues because I understand how money works. So I can evaluate what they're saying. Or if somebody says, um, we cut off trade with the world and that helped make us rich. Well, again, I, I can evaluate that because well, wait a minute, cutting off trade with the world, that's something that the enemy does to you during war. If that made you rich, why would the enemy blockade you? If that makes you rich, because now you'll buy American or whatever, why would we have blockades? Blockades are meant to impoverish you, right? So the same thing they use to impoverish you is probably not going to make your country wealthy. So you become cynical about the speeches and pretty words of politicians because you have the understanding of how the world works that you can put it, that you can set against what they're saying and draw your own conclusion. What is the most underappreciated contribution of the Catholic Church to Western civilization? Oh, geez. All right. Well, this is just for again for people who might not know, this is a reference to my book, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization. And it's organized in a series of chapters. So I'll talk about science. I, science is the longest chapter because everybody thinks, well, the church hated science because they just want people to be stupid and ignorant, to keep putting the money in the collection plate and all that. I know that. That was the conventional wisdom through the Enlightenment. That was why Voltaire was so unhappy, at least one reason. Then it was the conventional wisdom up through the late 19th century when the president of Cornell wrote a two-volume history on the alleged warfare between science and theology. That was Andrew Dixon White, Cornell. That was the conventional wisdom. That's not the conventional wisdom anymore. As of the 1950s, real historians of science do not believe that anymore. And if you don't believe me, there's a company called The Great Courses, and they sell courses taught by some of the top professors. Now, they are as plain vanilla as can be because they don't want to offend anybody. And because they're not libertarian, they're not conservative, they're not liberal, they just want to sell courses. So I took their history of science course just because I needed to see 
What is the guy saying? And sure enough, even there, when they're being as vanilla and inoffensive as possible, even they are saying, yeah, 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 we've long since passed, moved this, past the simplistic, the church hated science sort of thing, that we, we don't buy into that anymore. It's a much more interesting and complicated story, and I tell that in, in my book. So I, I guess I'll just stop there, but the, the book talks about international law, which by the way, international law does not have to mean the United Nations. It simply has to mean an understanding that there are certain general principles that apply not just to your enemy, but to you too, that all peoples in order to be moral have to subject themselves to, things like that. Also our current understanding of charity, that you, when you help somebody, you help them without expectation of reciprocity, or you make a donation, you don't necessarily do it to get your name on the building. This would have been thought of as, as unthinkable and inexplicable in ancient Greece or Rome. So there are a lot of things that we just are not aware of that we've inherited, whether we like it or not, from the church. Thank you to everyone for watching Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute. Dr. Woods, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Keith. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. And what I'll do is on the show notes page, I'll try and put as many of the books that I mentioned that I can remember now I'll try and put them there. So if you'd like to follow up with any of them, it'll be easier for you to do that. So that'll be tomwoods.com slash 1981. You should get to know the various people we talked about in this episode, and I'll give you the entry points for these various folks on that page. So check that out. Support the Tom Woods Show over at supportinglisteners.com, where you will get a huge, huge mountain of goodies as my thanks for your support. Thanks, everybody. Talk again tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.